A balanced diet is not just eating a certain number of calories, it requires a particular ratio and quantity of dozens of different nutrients. David Reubenheimer and Stephen Simpson have written two great books and authored many influential studies in nutrition. Ironically, they started out studying bugs when they made a momentous discovery regarding protein. No other species on the planet sees the protein percentage and they all do a fantastic job of getting it right. Today we have two very special guests, two Australian scientists who led the foundation for the biggest trend in nutrition today, which is shaping how we all eat. They've been a great influence for me and for the approach we take at Hava. Perhaps they've influenced how you eat already. And after listening to this podcast, I'm sure they will. David and Stephen, welcome to the Hava podcast. Great to have you on. Pleasure to Thanks be here, Andreas. Great to see you. So I mean, you're, you're both so influential in nutrition, um, but you started out in a different field. And, and for people who don't know you yet, uh, could you just share some about, about your background? Well, we got together in 1987 um, at the University of Oxford, and uh, we started uh, a project together there, which began by looking at locusts and looking at nutrient-specific appetites in locusts and diet balancing in locusts. And that built upon our um, careers to that date, which were quite, we were young then, much younger than we are now. And uh, I'd been working on locust feeding behavior and feeding physiology. And Dave, you tell your story. You arrived um, from yep. South Africa. I arrived from, so I'd been working on butterflies, on the feeding choices of caterpillars and the egg laying choices of butterflies in the wild. And um, um, I came to the conclusion, you can't understand ecology unless you understand nutrition. So um, I, when I finished my master's on the butterflies, um, I looked around for opportunities to get deeper into nutrition. Locusts were a really good opportunity. Steve was working on them, um, doing some really good work. And um, of course, they were economically important. And um, that's where we connected. And um, the rest is the story that we will be telling you about later in this podcast. Uh -huh. Because it's, it's kind of ironic. You, you started out studying bugs, basically. And, and now here you are, uh, uh, quite influential in how humans you know, should eat for, for health and, uh, and well-being. That's, uh, that's pretty <laughs> surprising, isn't it? From left wing, although we, at the time, um, always had the aspiration to elevate the biology of nutrition up to where we felt it should be much of the history of biology has involved people looking at sex and death um they, they've been the, the the two great areas of research you know predation avoiding being eaten mortality um, reproduction um, fitness and reproductive fitness but we all know that you can't do either of those things, um, either survive or thrive or reproduce and ultimately live a long life unless you have a balanced nutritional intake. And so we had a higher goal, a higher objective, which was to elevate nutrition up there with sex and death and the triumvirate of great su um, su subjects to study in the biological sciences. And obviously it led us ultimately into human health because we too are influenced by what we eat profoundly at every level. It, could I just add to that? It, it wasn't a surprising leap at all. It was like natural development because we started studying bugs, as you said, but what we found in bugs was that they didn't have a single appetite. They had separate appetites for different nutrients. And we realized that there were profound implications for this about the way that we think about nutrition, not only in, in human terms, but also in ecology. In my field at the time, it changed things fundamentally. So we went out and we looked at not just bugs, but we've looked at more than 40 species now. And we found the same thing in those species. So a natural question or even a natural assumption is that our species would be no different. 
And it's based on that progression that we then extended to, to asking the question, doing research to find out whether we too have these nutrient-specific appetites that regulate intake, not just of food or energy, but of specific nutrients separately. Right, because I, I think you're so influential. Uh, you're, you're the authors of this hypothesis called the protein leverage hypothesis. And you know, so many people today, they eat uh, higher protein diets and uh, you know, with various benefits. But much of the theoretical uh, uh, sort of underpinnings of, of, of eating like that is, is really based on this protein leverage hypothesis to some extent. Um, I think it's really, really fundamental to start thinking about foods, not just as uh, energy and you know, calories in, calories out, but, but really talking, uh, thinking about the quality of what you eat and how it influences uh, your body in various ways. So, could you, could you, I mean, where did this idea come from? How, how did it uh, kind of take shape? Well, protein leverage was one usage of a broader theory or a broader conceptual framework, um, which arose from the question, what is a balanced diet? And a balanced diet is not just, as you say, eating a certain number of calories. It requires that you eat or any organism eats a particular ratio and quantity of dozens of different nutrients, macronutrients, micronutrients. And so we used locusts as a model for developing what we call the geometric framework for nutrition. It was a way of expressing nutrient mixtures and studying them and relating them from uh, foods to nutritional requirements to nutritional state to outcomes, uh, including how much things ate and how they performed on different diets. So it's a really powerfully integrating framework, and hence we called it the nutritional geometry framework. Um, and emerging out of that was protein leverage as one example of the interaction between nutrients. So could you explain how this protein leverage um, works and what kind of implications it might have for humans even? Over to David. <laughs> yeah, well, we were speaking about nutrient-specific appetites. One of those appetites is for protein. Um, we have another for fat, another for carbohydrates, calcium and sodium. Basically, most animals have those five and perhaps a few more. Um, but the question then, in, 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 in balanced food environments, in normal circumstances, they use those appetites to balance the nutrient intake because each one is a means of telling behavior at a given time what it is that the body needs. And that's the way that animals and humans balance the nutrient intake. The problem, though, is in imbalanced food environments where there's too much of some things relative to other things uh, for which we have nutrient-specific appetites, they then come into competition with each other. Um, and the question is, which one is the strongest and wins out in those circumstances? And protein leverage is based on the observation that in humans and many other species, not all species, protein is the strongest of those appetites. Now, what that means is that if protein is diluted in foods or in the diet, our strong protein appetite causes us to compensate for that by eating more of the food. If it's fat and carbohydrates that's diluting protein, then we eat more fats and carbohydrates and more um, energy overall. And that, if you look at global and historical population data, that's exactly what's been happening in modern food environments, particularly with the influx of, and increasingly so, um, heavily processed, ultra-processed foods that are diluting protein relative to fats and carbohydrates. So what the protein leverage hypothesis pr proposes is that it's this dilution of protein in our food supply that interacts with our strong human appetite for protein to drive energy over consumption and obesity. That's the protein leverage hypothesis. And one of the most striking um, early examples, which takes us right back to our locust work, was we found that if we created our own ultra processed foods, so these are chemically defined diets, and added more and more fiber, which is indigestible fiber, if you dilute protein 
up to five times in the food matrix, then what we found was our locusts would eat five times as much food. So they'd increase the volume of food they consume to maintain their protein intake constant. And that required, um, you know, a real feat of gastrointestinal um, fortitude. They ended up with massively filled guts and they were producing vast quantities of fiber filled feces to get enough protein. So there was clearly this very powerful biological drive, which we then went, um, went on to understand physiologically by teasing apart the underlying mechanisms whereby the animal actually can detect protein in foods and, and its own state in relation to its protein requirements. Yeah, I mean, this is, is fascinating science. And uh, I think that what's even more fascinating is the implications for people today. I mean, we are living in a world where, like you mentioned, David, uh, there's a lot of ultra processed foods is actually the majority of what most people eat uh, today in, in many countries. And that food may have less protein in it because uh, protein is more expensive and uh, you can get various financial benefits by diluting it with other things such as sugar and added fats and so forth that are much cheaper and cause people to eat more. And uh, yeah, it's profit all around for <laughs> for a lot of actors, but perhaps not awesome for uh, the people eating because this contributes powerfully potentially to the biggest health problem in the world, which is uh, poor metabolic health driving all our top chronic diseases. So, um, I mean, really what you discovered could potentially be hugely impactful on the biggest health problem in the world in the world how do you how do you see that how does that uh, what, what does that make you think i feel we agree actually. of course but <laughs> well david I, i i think our most recent synthesis of all the evidence speaks to exactly what you've said and also speaks to the power of nutritional geometry as a as a way of, of really integrating all of this from basic mechanism all the way through to global food systems. Um, so I, I, I think Dave would just agree, wouldn't we? Uh, absolutely. Um, and it's important to stress, Steve mentioned nutritional geometry, that, that this isn't just a theory proposing that um, protein has driven obesity in the same sense as some propose that fat has and others propose that carbohydrate has. What nutritional geometry enables us to do is rather than separating out those nutrients and pointing at one or the other, is to look at the mixture and understand how those nutrients interact in driving our dietary behavior and the outcomes. Um, and protein leverage is such an interactive mechanism. It says that we overeat fats and carbs. Yes, they are responsible. They carry the excess calories into our body. But the reason for that can only be understood if we step back and look also at the third macronutrient protein. In fact, especially if we look at the third macronutrient protein, uh, which is protein. So it really is a fundamental frame shift. It says we don't, rather than saying we overeat fats and carbohydrates because we have strong appetites for those nutrients, what protein leverage proposes is that we overeat them because we have a weaker appetite for those than for the third macronutrient um, uh, protein. So, so it, it really is, I think, as Steve said at the beginning of this discussion, it, it certainly feeds into practical implications for the global obesity epidemic, but also, I think, into the way that we think about nutrition in general, rather than a single nutrient. Um, we believe that nutritional geometry and the stuff that we've done illustrates the importance of thinking about nutrient, nutrition as mixtures and complex interactions within those mixtures. Yeah, exactly. Just to make it super clear for everybody listening, uh, what you found in in locusts and, and other animals and what also seems to happen in humans is that if the food, uh, if the protein percentage is lower, if there's less protein as a percentage of the energy in the food, then you will need to eat more of it to get the protein that the body needs. The, the brain, the body will drive you to eat until you've had enough protein. And 
if the protein level of the foods you're eating are, are low, then you will basically have to eat more to reach that target. And, and that can drive overeating, can drive obesity. And that's also practically what we're seeing in the world today with the modern food supply being lower in protein, driving people to eat more. It's only a percent or a one and a half percent dilution um, by fat and carbs will drive a 10% increase in total calories. It's simple Euclidean geometry, but it's, um, it's incredibly powerful. And even worse, if as overweight, obesity, metabolic um, disruption, dysregulation kicks in, as it does with increased calorie intake, that pushes up your protein requirements. And that's well known, well understood. Physiologically, you become less efficient at using protein. So you eat, you have a higher target, you need to eat more. And that drives a, a vicious cycle. So, so you not only can explain some of the demographic patterns um, over time, but you can also start to understand why it is that obesity, for example, hasn't plateaued, it's continued to rise, and it needs a positive feedback. And here we have one, which is driven by this protein leverage effect, underpinned by a powerful protein appetite. Right. Uh, another thing I'm thinking about now, I would love to hear your point of view on it is, if people are slightly more sedentary today, less physically active in their daily uh, living, daily jobs and so forth, it would mean they, they burn fewer calories from carbs and fat. Uh, and, and that would kind of, I think, contribute to the, the, a need for a, actually a higher protein percentage in the foods that they eat uh, compared to a very physically active yeah. person. Exactly. So in the very first paper we published on this, where we set out the idea, and that was in 2005, we had a little panel of graphs which demonstrate each of these circumstances. One of them was if you reduce your expenditure of non-protein energy by becoming more sedentary, for example, that effectively increases the percent protein in your diet that you require um, in the same way as if your protein requirements themselves went up um, right. disproportionately. So the, there's a series of scenarios and we set them out in the original paper. And in fact, since then, we and others have collected both experimental and associational data that, that really support each of those predictions. Um, and we brought all that together recently in, in the, the most recent synthesis paper last year. We can link to that uh, in the show notes. Um, what, what I find a bit ironic here is that many people feel like uh, high protein uh, eating is for athletes and for people who want to build uh, big muscles and so forth, and which is uh, to some extent true, of course. But ironically, it may be that the people who are the least active may actually require more protein as well. And they yep. may not know it, right? True. Their bodies know it. Mm. But another thing I find uh, interesting, and I would love to hear uh, some stories, like here you come and you're studying bugs and you make a discovery with profound implica implications for human eating. And then nutrition scientists, they're doing all these observational data, asking people what they eat, etc., and finding weak correlations that may or may not have any connection to anything meaningful. Um, do you ever feel, do they ever feel, feel resentful to you? Like they're, they're spending their lives studying stuff and coming up with things that may or may not have any real relevance. And here you come, you're not even in human nutrition. You don't even ask humans what they eat. And then you come up with something that's arguably far more impactful and profound. I think that was initially the case and it wasn't just epidemiologists um, studying um, observational data on human diet. It was specifically experimentalists, wasn't it, Steve? It was, yes. Yes. And, and we had a famous admission we talk about in, in one of the chapters in Eat Like the Animals, where uh, our very first paper, the protein leverage hypothesis paper, was um, it sat at the journal for months and we heard nothing and there was no response from the editor or from the referees. And eventually 
uh, it was published and with rather little comment actually that but it was published and um, we gave a talk in Cambridge um, in 2005 the same year that it came out and I had a very distinguished human nutritionist and a, a lovely scientist great scientist come up and apologize for having sat on it um, and and say to us um, you have to understand this is very difficult for us. Um, people from outside the field came in and pointed out something that we probably should have seen ourselves. Um, please excuse us. So it was a it was a rather lovely admission. Yeah, that's the sign of a good scientist, somebody who's prepared to to go back. But I'd like to clarify exactly. one thing, Andres. I think um, it's very important not to be overly critical of our population level data they play. An incredibly those correlations you mentioned play an incredibly important role in nutrition science and i think it's got a bad rap lately um, undeservedly and the reason for that is for strong evidence you need two things you need evidence you need a mechanism you need to know that um, you've got causality what causes what you can't do that in population analyses, observational data, because it, as you say, it's just correlations. But you also need to address the question of whether the mechanisms and the causality you, you observe in experiments are relevant in a realistic, ecological, everyday context. And that is the great value of epidemiological data. And the gold standard is when those things converge, they tell the same story. And we now have that for protein leverage. We've got experimental data and we have abundant epidemiological observation data converging on the same thing. Strong protein appetites driving excess energy intake. And, and we also now have really good mechanistic data from preclinical studies as well. So the, the, the hormonal control of protein appetite, for example, um, we've published just very recently what I think is a, an, a, a very important paper in mice, um, teasing apart the role of um, a hormone called FGF21, which is released largely from the liver under low protein circumstances, um, and it turns on protein appetite and turns off carbohydrate appetite only if the animal is in a state of carbohydrate excess. So we, we've really looked at the macronutrient um, regulation response of this hormone, and it turns out to be primarily a protein hunger hormone. Um, and interestingly, it interacts with GLP-1 and the agonists for that we know are powerful weight loss drugs. So we think that the protein appetite signaling system is going to be intimately um, uh, intermeshed in the control of appetite in a way that might help explain why some of these pharmacotherapies are, are so effective in reducing appetite and weight gain. I can say we, we also have um, another source of evidence is we have comparative evidence. So primate studies have shown that Many species, most species, by far the most species of non-human primates also show the protein prioritization response, which underlies protein uh, um, leverage, a strongest appetite for protein, including our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees. That's interesting. It's maybe a, a bit of a fringe question, but I'm, I'm curious to your, your point of view. I mean, the uh, food industry often uses uh, glutamate or MSG to sort of drive people to want to eat their foods more. And that is sort of a marker, I guess, that makes the body believe that it's more protein in the food. Of course, there isn't if you just add the MSG. So how does that affect things? What are, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah, so we call that the protein decoy problem. Um, and in fact, we, we we've seen it experimentally uh, really quite strikingly in one of the clinical trials we ran um, in Sydney where we put subjects on diets which were comprised of menus of many different foods all of which were disguised and controlled in their macronutrient composition and we noticed that when our subjects were put on a 10% rather than let's say a 15 or 25% protein diet they ate 
about 12% more calories, which was as predicted by protein leverage. But they ate many of those calories by selectively snacking on savoury flavoured snack foods. Um, we provided snack foods, both savoury and sweet flavoured, but otherwise the same composition. And that's where the calories came from. So they were ingested by people seeking protein. Our subjects on 10% had elevated FGF21. They were protein seeking. They sought out, therefore, these snack foods that had savoury flavour characteristics, the classic ones being umami and salt, and they ate more calories overall as a result of that. So there was a beautiful example of it in practice, and we've seen that same pattern in population survey data as well. So as David said, you can go in with a mechanistic understanding and seek the signature of that in associational data. And when you find it, that's pretty powerful um, consilience of evidence um, in support of the idea. So it becomes unifying in that you're now looking at humans behaving in the wild, as David and his colleagues have done with primates, uh, as well as people in the laboratory in, in controlled um, circumstances, experiments, as it were. I mean, imagine this could really help drive uh, obesity uh, in the world if if people are low on protein and their bodies know it and they they try to seek uh, protein rich foods. But what what they end up with is uh, protein decoy from the food industry, right. just added MSG and and what they're really just eating even more uh, fat and carbohydrate and 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 uh, getting even more obese. Unfortunately, like what can we do about this? What can people listening do? Um, I mean, something I find interesting is is your your idea is people really need to, uh, or at least my interpretation of it is that many people can benefit from eating a higher percentage protein diet. So, so instead of diluting protein, you do the opposite. You 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 find foods that are are more rich in protein and has less added energy. Um, but how do you do that today? Because I mean, you, you see on you know, nutrition panels, you basically just see the protein and the calories. I guess you can calculate it if you're if you have a calculator or if you're really into it you could you could try to find foods with more protein for less calories but there really isn't a, a convenient way to see the protein percentage in foods is it well no other species on the planet sees the protein percentage and they all do a fantastic job of getting it right and they have the same mechanisms that we have. So we've got to ask, well, what is different about us than them that we need calculators and percentages and they don't? And the answer to that is not our biology, um, it's our food environment, is that we've hacked, we've just spoken about protein decoys, we've hacked the food environment in a way that if you put other species that prioritize protein into it, and there's lots of evidence for this, they too get fat. So we need to think about the food environment. And of course, that's a big project because that basically is changing the global food system. But there are personal food environments that are much easier to change and to, to remedy, to correct in that respect, in the respect that we've spoken about, dilution of protein from ultra-processed foods. And that's the home food environment. So the really easy, um, simple, approach to that doesn't involve calculations is to create a home food environment that consists of real foods, because that is the food environment that these amazing mechanisms in us and other species has evolved to do its job in. And that job is to balance our diets without energy overconsumption. So, so that's the one perspective and the one that I take myself, minimize the amount of processed foods taken into the house such that when we're hungry, and we reach for something to eat, it's not that. It's something that our appetites know how to guide us towards a, a balanced, um, healthy nutrient intake um, through engaging. And the other thing, Andreas, is, as you well know, um, is to guide people towards that outcome um, in various ways by taking the essentials of our science and translating that in, in, a, in a way that uh, and, and in a format that people can use to get them to the point where they've reconstructed their food environments such that their appetites are doing what they evolved to do. 
And I guess that's probably where you're going next. Yeah, I mean, I, that's what we're trying to do with our company, with Hava, with our app, etc. We're trying to guide people to more satiating foods. And, and I mean, our system uh, is really uh, leaning heavily on your on your research, uh, the protein percentage is the strongest factor in our satiety scoring. It's, it's not the only one, though. We also uh, consider energy density, fiber per calorie, uh, and sort of hedonic combinations of fat and sugar and, and carbohydrates and salt and fat and salt and so forth. W what's your take on that? Do you think uh, that seems sound? Or, I mean, is, is protein leverage the only thing? Or is there more things? And how would you, how would you critique this approach? What would you change? No, look, it's it's essentially um, nutritional geometry translated into uh, a satiety score, um, and we can we can argue about the evidence uh, that supports there being specific appetites that have direct access to satiety in the sense that physiologists would use the term. Um, that, that there isn't really strong evidence that there's more than probably half a dozen amongst the hundred or so nutrients that we require. But nonetheless, um, y y your models, as I understand it, do put quite a lot of weight on protein, on fiber, um, and on some of the other nutrient combinations that we know really are important and they're important and experimentally demonstrably important um, from our work and and that of others so that's that's a very sensible um, basis upon which to develop guidelines and tools for helping people balance their diet absolutely yeah, it's a mixture working, approach it's a mixture approach and you're working with our biology not trying to fight it and so much of um dietary advice um is to is essentially fighting biology and that you'll never win not not in the long term anyway and and what i like about that andreas is that it it's a way of speaking about home food environments it's a way of enabling people to understand home food environments um, and to transition to healthy um, home food environments. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the one thing that will fall out of your models glaringly obviously is the reduction of processed food. So it converges on the same story. Processed foods are not satiety producing because they're designed not to be satiety producing. A, a, a processed food manufacturer who designs something to be eaten less of um, is not going to do well in the competitive market of processed food. So the win. arms race is to get people to eat more of it. And um, whether it's scientifically, the, the extent to which it's scientifically versus, you know, bottom line figures, I don't know, but they've done a damn good job of designing things that are overeaten. And yeah, the that's smart people in the food industry, that's for sure. They, they do what uh, what brings profit. Uh, the only yeah. way to make profit from higher satiety foods, I guess, is to market them as such, like, a, I don't know, right. high protein this or that, and, and, and have people, t you know, really go for it because of that. And that's going to increase health inequalities. So one of the, I think one of the striking um, slides, or, or at least figures in our most recent paper is looking at, um, uh, providing a mapping of the cost of relative cost of macronutrients. And as you say, um, we've shown protein is expensive relative to fats and carbohydrates. And that encourages their d proteins dilution by, by particularly carbs. They're very cheap by food producers, but it also means that those who are, are less well off can't afford the higher protein that would otherwise prevent overconsumption. So you end up with this embedded social inequity, which which is again ultimately a consequence of our protein versus non-protein appetites um, being so um, asymmetrical in their influence over what we eat. Yeah, excellent. Of course, you end up with uh, inequality where. 
people of uh, who have lower incomes, they will tend to gravitate more to cheaper foods, so more budget friendly foods, and they they tend to be more obesity obesogenic. And and then you get uh, the result that that we have. I, I wanted to uh, get into one other thing, uh, which is. Uh, it's all it's all great to avoid ultra processed foods to the extent that you can, especially if you if you can afford it, of course. Uh, but some people may, if if they have obesity, if they have type two diabetes, uh, hypertension, etc., sort of metabolic health problems, they want may want to not just you know slowly slowly get back to baseline by by avoiding some ultra processed foods or most of it. Maybe they want a stronger effect, a faster. Uh, progression and and one way to do that could be to go higher in protein percentage even than what would be an average sort of real foods diet. How, how's your what's your point of view on that? So like a, going quite high in 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 protein. Well, look, therapeutic diets, um, high protein, particularly high protein, low carb diets are, are effective. There's no question of that, um, and they're influences at least in part mediated by people eating fewer calories because of the protein leverage effects that's all true um, i think the one thing we do know as biologists and particularly with an interest in evolutionary biology is that there's seldom if more is good than even more is better in biology there's typically a sweet spot and as we've demonstrated now for many years, there are costs to eating too high uh, an intake uh, of protein as well. So it's a matter of weighing the costs and the benefits. If the benefits of um, assisting with weight loss, maintenance of weight, um, uh, re-regulation of metabolism uh, are worth paying the price, then that's great. But there is a, there is a price. So talk about the price. What's the price of uh, protein? Well, as we and now quite a lot of groups around the world have shown, um, higher protein intakes drive some of the canonical pathways that are known to be associated with um, with aging, particularly in midlife. Um, and we've really tracked this in detail in our studies um, in mice and again sought similar patterns in human associational data. Um, so higher protein during midlife up until early late life, uh, unless you're doing lots of anabolic exercise, um, is associated with a higher um, age-specific mortality, a higher risk of a range of of different um, deleterious health outcomes. Um, and again, the mechanisms are really well understood um, by those who work in the community of the biology of aging. So that's that's the downside. But it, it's also worth emphasizing that we've discussed mostly protein for obvious reasons, but an important part of the mixture is, is fiber. You've mentioned that on a few, a few occasions. That too is very satiating. And what it means is that to some extent you can trade off fiber against protein and still not under, uh, still not overeat energy on relatively low protein diets. And that's why plant based, largely plant based diets are important. Kind of consistent with our approach as well that, you know, it's mm -hmm. not just protein, but you can also use levers such as fiber, as you mentioned, energy density or avoiding ultra processed, hyper palatable foods uh, to, to exactly. get more of a balance. But I would exactly. like to push back a little bit about this uh, protein and aging idea. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, most of it comes from mice and such uh, who may not have been sort of uh, from an evolutionary perspective, high level predators and and omnivores in the same sense as, as humans. But, but another um, factor I find even more interesting is that you know, metabolic syndrome, as you are well aware, is sort of also connected to aging. Type 2 diabetes is connected to aging. You get all these yep. uh, chronic diseases connected to aging, heart disease, cancer, uh, dementia, everything is vastly accelerated with yep. uh, with metabolic syndrome. And, and we have a, a population today where 93% of the adult US population have signs of, of metabolic syndrome. And, and then I'm thinking, going higher protein, at least for a while to fix things, 
oh yeah might, no question. might actually slow aging right absolutely no 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 question that comes back to the trade-off um what yeah, there, there are costs to going higher than optimal but they are outweighed by the benefits in that case of massively um, dysregulated population metabolism you know if you're looking at a population scale um at what you say makes sense nobody would argue about that it's um but it is worthwhile understanding that too little is no good but equally too much has its own costs and consequences it's also very worthwhile distinguishing between therapeutic diets that are designed specifically for a medicinal reason effectively therapeutic reason and habitual diets which are baseline diets and i think those things especially in the fad diet um, area are often confused so a keto diet mm. might be good for epilepsy and, and other medical type conditions but maybe less so as a habitual diet that's a very important distinction mm. Um, so, uh, before we wrap up, I would love to hear your point of view. Or like what, what's too high? Let's say once, once you reach, uh, well, sort of, uh, how, how high would you be comfortable with people going in, in a protein percentage, uh, level when they're doing it for therapeutical short-term purposes, reversing type two diabetes, obesity and such. And, and how, how high would you be comfortable? The second part of it, how high would you be comfortable with for people who are maintaining at their normal sort of health and weight level what do you think is reasonable well if you if you look across all human populations that have ever been recorded percent protein in the in the diet never falls below about 10 percent nor above about 25 to 30 percent um and that's a that's a reasonable range 10 in a junk food environment is catastrophic but in a high fiber um environment is very healthy um 30 percent is probably at the top end of of what i'd reckon well that's what i could stomach i can't imagine can, trying to eat anything higher than that in the longer term and and for sort of therapeutical purposes is it like as high as you can stomach or or do you have any concerns about going high for, for me that that's that's a medical question that should be dealt with on a case by case basis by accredited dietitians um, it's very hard for me to answer that case in the general it depends on the trade off where you sit in the trade off it depends how long the exposure will be for it depends on activity levels other it's a very complex issue and um, so i certainly wouldn't yeah. recommend it on, on that. not not asking you, any of you to give any medical advice or personal advice of course just uh, your sort of perspective as scientists uh, what you would consider reasonable like is it do you see any specific dangers of let's say you go on a high protein diet of let's say 40 percent protein for a few years to reverse type 2 diabetes and obesity and then you go down again do you see any sort of ge general risks for general people leaving aside specific specific cases uh, again as david said it's we're, we're not here to provide medical advice i i wouldn't do it i must say and and we wouldn't get here's another question if we as scientists went to seek ethics permission which we must whenever we run a clinical trial and we asked to do that experiment we would be denied um, we couldn't do that experiment um, obviously people are free to do that experiment themselves but we we couldn't because we'd lose our jobs because we wouldn't be able to do it um, so that's that's one that's one indicator but <laughs> yeah well, i do suspect a 40 percent protein diet would be very very difficult to adhere to for for three years because we oh, also yeah. have appetites for fats and carbohydrates and um, those will be screaming at us after a while which is why high protein diets uh, weight loss diets tend not to be sustainable in the long term 
people go back to eating um, carbohydrates. Fiber, I think, plays a really important part, balances it out. A more balanced macronutrient ratios with good levels of satiety. And certainly we, we published data showing that from a, an analysis of a, a range of different dietary interventions. And it was very interesting. People early on would adhere to the high, well, this is 30%, not anything higher, as high as 40%. But over time, over weeks and months, they drift back towards um, a lower percent protein. And that's, as David said, reflecting the fact that there's more than protein as an appetite. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're correct that uh, most people would find it hard to go to 40 for years and years and years, I, I think is, is probably a temporary thing for most people with specific goals in mind. Um, so that makes perfect sense to me. Um, yeah, uh, just a, a final Final question. I, I know you've you've heard a little bit about our our approach with uh, uh, protein being a very big factor, energy density being another big one, and, and hedonic factors, and, and protein perhaps a slightly uh, lower weight one. Well, we know calcium and sodium. We have appetite for that, but we cannot feel that that is already in some ways covered by its inclusion in this, uh, partially in the hedonic factor, but also that these uh, nutrients tend to come with protein rich real foods. That's a crucial point, actually, Andreas, that our appetite system has evolved to take advantage of naturally occurring correlations. So we attend to a smaller number of nutrients, not every single one, because in nature, in natural foods, they're usually correlated. So protein will be correlated with, with many of the mineral micronutrients, um, often so you don't need a separate appetite for every single micronutrients um, because they'll come together with the with the ones that you are regulating uh, exactly. and of course the problem in our modern nutritional environment is that we've smashed those correlations through ultra processing exactly but if uh, from your uh, knowledge of of our system with satiety scoring with these factors uh, what, uh, if you could change one thing to make it better, what would it be? Me would be to shift the balance in um, modern food environments, in the diets in modern food environments towards um, whole unprocessed foods. I view those as playing an important role as entertainment foods, but when they displace diets or distort diets, that's what they've done in modern food environments, that's where the problems arise. But when it when it comes to to your platform, Andreas, I I think it's potentially a really useful um, experimental tool. You're going to be deriving data through users that may actually be really helpful when it comes to testing hypotheses around which of the dimensions that we should really care about, and you may find that we discover new nutrient appetites as a result of that. But it's a, it's a platform that you've based on uh, existing knowledge, and it provides the opportunity for us to pursue that further in experiments to test some of your assumptions, not, not only us, but anybody in the scientific community. So we, we can engage with it because it makes it makes sense to us coming as we have from a background where we treat nutrition as a multi-dimensional geometric problem. And that's kind of what you're doing. Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, I, I totally agree. And I would love to use it like that with uh, users, users who consent to share, share data for that purpose. Um, sort of like you said, uh, an approach that both takes in the best science available and trying to update our approach based on available best best data at, at every point. And then also aspirationally, if we can uh, grow it to uh, sufficient size and, uh, and data collection and, and get uh, consenting users to share data, then contributing to human knowledge about nutrition would be amazing. I think another really important um, potential for it is to feed into dietary guidelines because you're really looking at nutrition in the right way 
there and the extent to which that does and doesn't agree with diet, current dietary guidelines. I suspect it largely does in Australia in any case. I'm not so sure about the United States, but I think that's an interesting, potentially very useful and, and important uh, uh, question. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's my time we could do a follow up episode and uh, I can we could dive into intricacies of protein leverage and critique against it and, and your replies to those, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so much for coming on today. It's a pleasure, Andres. It's a pleasure. Thanks for asking us.